grab that mic, that would be great. The first question that has been referred to a little bit already is the Wine and Creek question. So, where is it up to, the development there? Um, what can we expect? And just a bit of a progress update for the community for Wine and Creek. Sure. Well, um, the Walker Corporation met with us this week um, to make sure they were right, on the right track, I guess. Um, they are due to have uh, their proposal to us by the end of this year. We're thinking, you know, by the end of December. Obviously, we're going into that silly season and so things uh, may just fall over into the new year. I guess if I was going to talk um, with that, there are, it's commercial incompetence, obviously, that we, we aren't able to talk about. But I know that Mark, in particular, and myself, have been very, very determined to make sure that whatever happens there is a better outcome. Not the same as, uh, not business as usual. So it's fair to say they came to us earlier in the year and we didn't think it was good enough. And we sent them back to the drawing board and they've taken that on board. And obviously, Toondah Harbour has progressed. Slightly different challenges at Toondah Harbour. Uh, we own a lot more land down there and so does the state government. So the opportunities and challenges are a little bit different to Wynum Creek. Um, but I can assure you that we're on their case. Uh, Mark is on their case all the time. So hopefully towards the end of the year we'll, we'll know a little bit more about that. But it's certainly still in the pipeline and we won't be letting go until we get... Particularly we know we're going to deal with your car parking um, challenges on, on, the, on the mainland at Wynum Creek. Uh, and so that is a huge focus of ours as, as well as the fact that we see that as an opportunity for local employment. If I could just add something to that, the, uh, I looked at the, the, the Toondah Harbour application has gone before the Federal Government and they've lodged uh, a number of documents there for it and I was looking through those documents such as environmental impact studies and things and I was pleased to see that the Wynum Creek uh, area is also covered in those documents so it's not as if we're going to be playing catch up uh, and it's uh, and because it's a, uh, a mainly on land development rather than over water development like Turnda, uh, that makes it more uh, readily to progress on a, on a construction base. And just to further on that, just to explain to you the EPBC, um, the EPC legis EPPC legislation and how it works, and Andrew might be better versed than I, uh, it, it does take a long time to actually get that that approval, the federal government approval. They need to go through four seasons and make sure that there's not going to be impact on the environment. It's a very important um, piece of legislation and study that needs to be done. Uh, our bay is obviously our best asset, so we want to get it right. But uh, for example, we, we would expect that Turner Harbour will be about a 12 month process going through state and federal EISs um, before they can move forward with the next part of their project. So there's one follow up question to that. Um, with Wine Creek, is there an expectation that there will be more car parking available? I could probably say that the whole purpose of redeveloping Wine and Creek was to resolve the parking issue. And not only to resolve it, to, to have a plan going forward that it's actually going to be catered for in future years to come. Um, the, um, uh, as, as, Karen, as Karen said there, it's commercial incompetence, but probably fair to say that the, uh, the initial plans that were presented to us, we didn't think adequately catered for this. And all I can say is about the, the recent discussions is I feel quite good about what I've seen. I hope what comes back to us at the end of the year is fine. Excellent. So I have a bucket of bridge questions here. So we can't avoid it any longer. We have a full complement of people. So let's wade into the bridge. There's some both pro-bridge and anti-bridge questions here. So... Can we read them out in, in the series? And yes. Make sure we answer All right, we'll try every one of them. I will probably um, pack some of the similar ones up together. All right, question number one. The state government has been approached on a number of occasions over the years by lobby groups on the idea of a bridge. The state government's latest response has been to push it back to local government. There's been a bit of a ping pong game going on. <coughs> so, why is it that the draft Redland City Council City Plan doesn't address the bridge? On page 32 of the draft state government infrastructure plan, it discusses the value of public-private partnerships to fund local infrastructure. It reiterates that since private sector finance is done on the commercial terms, then governments must consider the ultimate cost and the benefits. As neither level of government appears to be able to have said no to bridging, 
except they can't fund it, isn't it therefore necessary for them to provide an updated feasibility study with cost-benefit analysis for the market to consider? Part three. Actually, no, I'm just going to do parts one and two here. So, can somebody, I suppose it's the local government, why isn't it in the planning scheme, in the draft planning scheme? It's the first question that we will address them one by one. Karen. Back on, sorry. Um, well, firstly, to be able to put that in a planning scheme, you need to know where the bridge is going to go. And to do that, you need a feasibility study. And so there are there's a lot of work to be done before council can acknowledge that in a city plan. I do want to address the, the ping pong game, which someone's got a bigger bat than me. Um, it, it's, it was a change of position from the state government that we recently heard about, um, albeit I don't, I'm not quite sure that they understood the finer detail of the position of the, the previous government, at least. So we did actually put a, a motion, or Mark put a motion to council last year, late last year. 20th of August. <laughs> Pardon? 20th of August. Last year, yes. that's right. And you recall that then Deputy Premier responded, uh, it was Jeff Zini, basically saying that there was no funding available for a bridge and that they were focusing on water transport, if, if I've summed that up correctly. Uh, so, uh, just coming back to, um, the, if you're going to plan for it, you need to know where it is. I, I'm really conscious that our community in Redlands and the Southern Morton Bay Islands, as a collective, have uh, probably been one council that have had to deal with a series of communities that are living here that have had little infrastructure, and you know what I'm talking about. We're talking about roads, water, waste, all those sorts of things. For this community to take on another challenge that is the responsibility of the state government would be unfair to each and every one of you. In my view, the state government have pretty much walked away from much of their responsibility, this is over a period of time, I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about way back into the 70s, in providing each and every one of us here on the islands with the relevant infrastructure. We inherited that back in the 70s. So for us to go out there and actually put ourselves out there to be the responsible person and not have the state government driving it will put, put us back in that same position. And I'm not prepared as a leader in this community to make sure, to let the state walk away from their responsibilities. So in comparison to other places in Queensland, for example, the Red, in Redcliffe and Bribery Island, the feasibility studies were not funded by the local government. They, were, they were, had funding from the state government. Why are we different? So my view is if the state government are keen to work with the local government to look at the feasibility so that we know that it actually stacks up, then we're happy to work with that. But we're not going to put the horse before the, the cart before the horse because it wouldn't be fair to you because you will be picking up the bill. So I'm not quite sure of the amount of money that they, they actually dedicated to feasibility studies in the north of Brisbane, but it was like you know two or three million dollars to start the ball rolling. So when we've got that information, then we can we can actually start thinking about planning for it. And when you plan for road corridors, it's a six-year term you, that you've got to do that. So it's you, you have to be ready to go when that happens. I'm sure that Mark could probably add more to it, but um, and then and then maybe and then maybe Matt. Mark, did you want to just uh, finish up on the your motion, etc.? The the motion I brought in was uh, to we've, we've always had a position from the state that it was a big marine-based transport from the islands. And so the motion I brought in was to specifically to bridge Russell Island and, uh, and acknowledge that the state is responsible for the, the cost of doing so and providing it. And from that we wrote to the state to try and change their position from a marine base uh, transport to, to consider uh, infrastructure of a bridge. And of course that, that wasn't the case. Um, I've, in my heart of hearts, I know there comes a point in time with these islands that we'll need to, I, doubt, I don't know where the ferry has got the capacity to move all the people that's going to come here. Before I was a councillor, I did a, uh, a proposal for a short barge route, and that could even be the, the first point of time. I know when I had discussions with the, the barge company at the time, they weren't interested in doing that. So uh, there needs to be some sort of commercial driver for this, some sort of uh, parties. Uh, over the past few years, I don't know how many people, individuals I've met, met with potential, potential investors and, brought, and spoken with them about the islands. Uh, at this stage, there hasn't been that um, uh, return that they've, uh, the high level return they've done on the bridge. I think it will come, but uh, how we come about there, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I've subsequently followed up with the incoming government to to clarify their position on um, 
on access to the islands and they've reiterated that it, they see it as marine access only. Um, but uh, taking Karen's point, I'm happy, um, very happy to advocate for funding for a feasibility study um, so that we can um, get the, um, uh, the baseline and, uh, and then we can consider uh, the best options. And that might be, there might be some role there with the, with the feds as well. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty limited at the moment to uh, infrastructure up to $5 million. Uh, it has to demonstrate an economic benefit, so we'll need a plan. But we don't fund the plans. We rely on the community pulling that together and then finding the partnerships, which the federal government can then uh, tip in and make it very clear to your private sector partners that the federal government's serious about it happening. But if you don't have that will from state and local, then there won't be any federal dollars. I guess just addressing what the, um, the DG, uh, DTMR uh, stated just not recently in regards to pitting it back to council saying that you could use what we call the local government infrastructure plan. And this is probably double dutch to a lot of you, but um, the state government legislate planning to a very, very detailed degree. And the LGIP, or we call it the LGIP um, affectionately, is a document that councils have to create so that they can actually uh, retrieve infrastructure charges from development or for developers. As you know, we actually inherited these islands already developed without any infrastructure. There is very little opportunity for further subdivision on this island, so there is no opportunity to use a local government infrastructure plan to get the developer to pay for infrastructure. And that was pretty much what the, uh, the DG said when he talked about um, the bridge through from Russell to Stradbroke Island, that councils could put it in their LGIP. There is no point in us putting in an LGIP. It is an anomaly. We have an anomaly here in Redlands. It's a great opportunity, but it's not one that I think we should let the state walk away with, um, you know, no responsibility, particularly a financial contribution. So um, it's good to hear that Matt's going to take it up um, and look forward to seeing what opportunities that there are. And I also want to add that uh, the state government's draft infrastructure plan has just been released, and I think submissions might have just closed this week. Um, not only is there no mention of a bridge in, in their draft infrastructure plan, they've also taken out the eastern busway, and there is no duplication of rail. So what I'm coming back to is saying that they are very open to market-led proposals, and I think Mark touched on that. And as a community, if we can work together to make sure it's feasible, and we can pull together a market-led proposal, I'm more than happy to champion with anyone for opportunities to connect, and not just um, not necessarily just a bridge, but to connect um, the Southern Morton Bay Islands better to jobs uh, and opportunities on the mainland. So I uh, look forward to being able to have a chat with Matt. And that really answers the question about the opportunities for private sector finance and market-led interventions into this space and of understanding quickly we're talking about the need for a feasibility study that actually puts that option onto the table. Great. Okay, that's fine. So, I will now um, take my horns off and put my normal hat on, or depending on what side I'll put my horns on, and ask the other side of this, why does Russell Island have to be bridged? Australia has to move to a knowledge economy as evidenced by overseas experience with NBN that Andrew recently talked talk about. Why can Russell not become a knowledge economy and retain its unique island experience? And there's similar questions there. Someone talks about why is a bridge being considered when more than 50% of residents across all the islands don't want one? And I know people will debate those figures, so don't. Um, why would we need a bridge? <laughs> First came off the rank, hopefully you forget what I said by the time everyone else talks. Um, look, the, the question um, has been raised many times, why do we need a bridge and um, why don't we um, already have a bridge? And when I was um, um, running uh, at election, I, I did a few um, mobile offices out at Wynnum Creek and um, you know, a, a ferry would pull up and a bunch of people would say, build a bloody bridge. And, uh, and then uh, don't build a bloody bridge. Um, so it's, I, I don't think it's a question uh, for, a, for us to make the decision. Um, it's a question for the island communities. And it's, um, I think it, it's important that um, 
the, the Bay Islands uh, uh, work together on resolving this because we wouldn't, or I certainly wouldn't want to see uh, one island um, benefit at the expense of, of others. And I think uh, I think all islands need to um, to work together and, and move together. Now, I, I did a, uh, a survey that was very well um, had, a, had a great response from the islands, and uh, it was uh, a strong um, response when you took the islands collectively, not to bridge Russell Island, um, but for from Russell Island in particular. Um, there was a majority of Russell Islanders that responded to the survey that wanted a bridge. And that's, that's really the, um, the crux of, of what we're talking about now. So um, as your state, state member, I've got, I've got a, you know, a stake in, uh, in whether a bridge happens or not. Um, I'm led by the community, but the, I, the community needs to come together and it, it's really, it's a, it's a line ball. It's really 50-50 when you take in all the islands. Um, but it may be Russell Island's decision. So I don't know if that answers anyone's questions, well, but I that think it helps. Yeah. Uh, look, I think um, the the question of a bridge um, will continue to come up probably more often if we continue to do things the same way we always have. Fact is that there is population growth on these islands. And uh, you know, I think it's probably over a, a long period of time, up to 20,000 people living on these islands. Clearly, if we all need a car on both sides and we need to have work on, on the mainland, then that's going to put pressure on connecting these islands or some of the islands to the mainland. And I guess, um, I think times are changing very quickly and, and this was something that came up time and time again in the, the Redlands on the Move forums about transport. And um, you know, Clem was there, and a few, a lot, a lot of people there. About what's what's changing? Technology is changing. Uh, we're living in this knowledge economy, and I think that's absolutely part of the key. Even if it's not completely changing how we do things, but starting to make a move towards being able to work and live and everything from the island. Our planning sc schemes, I hope, starts to address that for you, where you can actually have your character residential zone, growing your own food and veggies making your own local markets, etc. But the thing is, if we continue to do things the way we do it today, that the pressure on bridging the islands will continue. And I think that is probably what drives it, and the ageing population and access to services, uh, state government services, health, uh, police, all of those sorts of things, that will continue to put pressure on the debate on the bridge, there's no doubt about it. But I actually think that this community is quite creative. Um, I know they're creative. And I, I think technology is changing in a way that we should be embracing that. And that does come back to the, the likes of internet connectivity. Uh, you can talk to anybody anywhere in the world at any time now. Um, I was a young girl not too long ago, and that, you know, that was a big, a big effort to be able to speak to someone overseas. Well, now you can do it regularly, all day, every day, if you want to. Um, so there, there are definite markets coming up that we should be able to embrace. And certainly I'd like to think that um, we can think outside of the square do things differently here on the island. So that pressure uh, remains at least not as, it doesn't increase at least, and then you have an opportunity as a community to decide as we go, what is the best outcome to maintain your very special lifestyle here on Southern Morton Bay Islands? I, I don't necessarily think that it has to be a bridge, but we have to plan for transport in some form or another. And we need to have 10, 15, 20 year plan of how we're going to get there, how we're going to go for different stages. Um, it, this is an economic conference today, that discussion we're having, and I look at these islands and I thought if there is any way to improve the interconnectivity between our own islands, we create a certain mass of population that if we were a regional town we'd have a hospital and all sorts of things, we'd have better policing, infrastructure, and everything could build upon itself. So one of the other ways that, thinking of all that different aspects, we should be thinking how we can improve the inter-island access 24 hours so that we can actually build an economy, on island, an island economy, where there is less pressure or need to go to the mainland. So that's another thing, another discussion which needs to be had and thought out. But we need to do the planning. And in that planning, yes, a bridge is part of that. It's not necessarily the only thing, but we have to look at everything holistically and start seriously planning out for the next 15, 20 years. Hard to disagree with anything that has been said, but 
we need to realise we're probably the only subtropical islands in the world that can commute on a daily basis to a major CBD centre. Uh, this will continue to create pressures where the disadvantage of, of living on an island will continue to be talked about. And ultimately, if they are your main concern, uh, the only realistic transport infrastructure that's going to cope with the population Karen describes is bridging. I don't quite share Matt's point of view that if we do something for one island, we have to do it, uh, tr treat them equally. I think in reality, there'll be a marginal analysis where islands are picked off one at a time for bridging. Uh, crazy brave to make predictions, but in our lifetime, we will see this island bridged probably in the next generation, uh, Maclay and the third generation strategy. I mean, ultimately, you simply can't have the population growth we have without these areas being connected. No matter how strong our views are, one way or the other, our children will make these choices. And being this close to the fastest growing and, and one of the wealthiest cities in the OECD means that the pressure will be enormous and it won't come from islanders, it'll come from mainland. Excellent, thank you. So a text here. Can you bring us home a bottle of red wine? <laughs> 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 Well, there's someone here, I'm guessing. <laughs> okay, so continuing on the um, the theme of transport, let's talk about um, barge routes and short barge routes. And so just a bit of a reflection on has any progress been made? So we've had short barge routes talked about Rocky Point, Russell Barge Group would make a very accessible barge. Um, has this progressed any further? There's another question about uh, the north end of Maclay Island. Uh, access there. So, if you would like to comment on the short barge routes. Um, I can only say that uh, I mentioned before that before I was in council, I did do a document which I presented to council and uh, the state members around uh, short barge routes. How I and, and Rocky Point was one of those those places. And during that time. Uh, I met with Energex who were keen to have something go across there because it would reduce some of their maintenance costs and I met with the then state member Coomera and he was keen because he thought it would uh, bring forward some uh, roadworks to the main highway. Uh, however, then I met with uh, Strabrake Ferries uh, and their response was that they have no interest in moving. So unless you have a, an operator prepared to go in there and have it market driven again, uh, that's that's the crux of it all. Yeah. Um, if you've got a fair, and, and in my own mind, competition's what we need. If to have a second ferry operator or a barge operator would be great because that drives down prices and, uh, and improves performance. But until there is an operator prepared to go down there, I don't think there's going to be uh, uh, much development on that front. That's okay. All right, well done, deal. Question here specifically for Andrew, and it's saying, can he use his influence on Mr Turnbull to ask his wife, who I think was on the board of Sealing, but probably no longer is on the board wing, to get some cheap affairs. <laughs> Gee, I really should have a wittier response than I do. Uh, I think there is, uh, there can be reasonable concerns about the consolidation of, 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 of that sector and, and the lack of, of competition that's resulted. But unfortunately an assessment was made by the competition authority who found that that merger wouldn't have a substantial impact on price. And when I talk to particularly the Stradbroke providers, they tell me that they're simply moving towards the model used by the airline, which is that uh, if you're going to occupy um, in peak periods, that price has to go up for both locals uh, and for visitors, but they want to keep the cheapest possible price, which hasn't changed at entry level uh, for locals who travel off peak. So ultimately, just as you jump on an aeroplane around Christmas, it'll cost more. That's uh, where they're heading as well. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm maybe it's, I'm a glass half full sort of person, um, and I, look, I appreciate that Kangaroo Island have that had their challenges, but what sea link bring to Redlands, um, Stradbroke Island in particular at the moment? They've got they're transitioning out of an economy at the moment uh, in the next three years, I believe. Um, is that they also bring a huge tourism uh, database and knowledge, um, which. I would suggest is pretty vacant in our city. So, look, I'm not going to say that it's all going to be rosy, um, but I would like to think that we could capitalise on their knowledge and what they've done in other parts of Australia uh, to bring those opportunities, which I think Southern Morton Bay Islands is calling out for, getting the tourism here. Uh, what can we do with a great port, whether it be at Turner or Wynum, 
um, to make sure that we're the, we're the first stop that people who get off the plane 35 minutes away at Brisbane International Airport come uh, to Redlands to either one of Creek or Redland Bay. When you've got a, a, a organisation or a, a corporate company like Sea Link that have been doing that in other parts of Australia, I think we have opportunities. So. Like I said, um, no guarantees it's all going to be rosy, but let's look at the opportunities that they bring, which we probably wouldn't have had, had that not occurred. Excellent. Thank I you. I might just add to what Karen said. I, um, I met with the CEO of C-Link um, a number of weeks ago, and they indicated that, that their model um, is to, um, I guess, backfill the, uh, the times where the ferries are relatively empty um, with the tourism sector. So that, um, I'm very optimistic that, that they'll be looking for opportunities to um, to uh, build, uh, well, to play their part in tourism in Redlands. Great, thank you. Right, a few simpler questions. Some, some one for Mark. Um, is Russell Island's name change to Kanaipa still going on? Uh, the, I haven't heard any answer from the Minister. Uh, I, I couldn't answer that. It's probably something that Matt would have to show up. Can I ask? Uh, well, just informally, um, it is still happening. I have spoken to Minister Lyon, um, and my understanding is that if it does, it does occur, it will be a dual naming, and uh, there'll be an opportunity for uh, the, the community to decide how they refer to home. So, but I haven't heard, there's no formal decision, but it is still happening, and I would have thought that it probably would be uh, some sort of announcement looming, but I haven't been told exactly when. Great, thank you. Okay, so back to jetties and water and things. Um, there's a couple of questions here around the jetty refurbishments, the upcoming jetty refurbishments. So there's, there's two in that one, once, as I walked up, the ferry with uh, John today and looked at the much um, valued trolley. Um, someone said, "Is it, are we losing our trolley? So uh, the question here about people like the trolley, Mark. We love, we love the trolley. Uh, some months ago, we had a meeting with uh, council officers and also transport and main roads. That the Russell Island jetty there that they're refurbishing or fixing up at the moment is a state-owned asset. It's not a council-owned asset. Uh, one of the issues they've got with it is that the, uh, the structural integrity of it has diminished over time, and they believe that having the, uh, the trolley where it is on the side is, can act as a cantilevering effect and place some weight. So they said to me that they, uh, they are going to not only do some uh, structural repairs on it, but they're going to remove that trolley. And I said to them, well, one, it's being used a lot, and and I believe it should stay. Um, so we are not throwing the, 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 the trolley away. Um, I don't, they've also said that the, the jetty is actually due for replacement in two years' time, and they said that in April next year, they intend to have some community engagement about what's going to be down there. Uh, I suggested to them that they should consider having uh, another trolley. It might be a rubber-wheeled one or something like that because people use it. Um, I think there's probably going to be further discussions on what's going to happen on the foreshore down there because um, I'm just getting away for it a little bit, but we've got a... I think there's a case of changing what we've got down there to something more accessible and more boats being able to tie up and things like that. But they said they're going to come back with a discussion in April next year. They've got their notices down there. If they've got any concerns or or, or uh, comments about it, they've got a number there for you to ring and discuss. Great. Because there was a, a, sorry, the part of the question I missed there was the heritage value that the trolley has and trying to retain the heritage value. Yeah, right. We'll be retaining the, that particular uh, trolley. We'll be retaining it. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Um, question for Andrew. How can small business obtain assistance to enhance or start up a new venture? It won't surprise you there's not much help. And typically, government is reluctant to give money to new businesses and take risks with your public money uh, and allow others to learn the hard way that it's actually a very, very competitive area and has a high failure rate early. 
Uh, there were comment grants and others for people who were moving specifically to developing new products and taking a beta, uh, a, a beta model to uh, production if there were commitments to purchase. On Monday, as I've said, 30 new policies coming out in the innovation space. Obviously, we're not all in that sector. But we do refer to the valley of death, where great ideas all appear to uh, vanish and, and not be able to hit critical mass. And, and these 30 policies will be addressing that. So it's not good news as far as uh, money to allow people to start a business. Um, that's not where government typically invests. But it won't surprise you that I'll be saying that making uh, the economy as vibrant as possible uh, as you've seen this month and this quarter, increases in spending, substantial increases in consumer spending, are the conditions together with flexible employment uh, that allows people to start businesses and keep them afloat. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just going to mention that, albeit that public money is not being used to sort of uh, give you know invest in your business, there is business advice available. Council did run a business grow program for a number of years and uh, this year we were very, very grateful that the federal government stepped in and started funding that program. So um, those business enterprise centres do give advice to people who want or who are in business and, and need assistance and, and it's probably really important that you know about that. And I'd also like to once again come back to that innovation uh, point that I, I was in Canberra with Councillor Mayors and um, met up with, with Andrew down there on Monday. and. Um, I'm interested to see what's going to come out with the innovation papers that uh, Wyatt Roy is, I think, working on. Uh, and I think tomorrow is it? Oh, there you go. So I, look, I just, I'm, I'm really going to encourage people to start thinking outside the square and your opportunities to maintain the amazing lifestyle you have and look at what government are offering as opposed to asking them for something in particular and, and try and fashion your thinking uh, and your planning around the way things are changing and what government is doing. So I think that's something we should look out for. Thank you. The Bay Islands have access restrictions, few boats and no tourist facilities. Is it possible to transform into a sanctuary cave accommodating watercrafts and businesses as well as developments in commercial and shopping facilities? Sanctuary cave. That's a, that's a wide question. Uh, look, anything's possible, but you need to have people that are really prepared to invest their money in doing those sorts of things. And uh, I would suggest that in today's day and age, uh, you know, the environmental hurdles that you need to do anything on the waterfront, just ask council. It takes us literally three or four years just to get a permit to fix something up on your foreshore. Um, so the confidence, the business confidence in doing something like that, you have to be pretty brave, I think. But these are sorts of things that people need to come to the table with, showing that it will stack up. Um, but it wouldn't be something I think that government would be keen to to, to do. It's really up to business uh, and investors to come forward with those ideas. And uh, I, I, being really honest, I don't see that happening. Um, for Southern Morton Bay Islands, uh, another sanctuary cove wasn't necessarily a great um, great success. I don't think. As a, as a keen boating and uh, someone who likes to, to use their boat to get over here for um, official functions as well as recreation, I would love to see um, any, any kind of facility that would allow me to, um, to tie my boat up safely um, whilst, I'm, whilst I'm on the island, um, to spend time here, to spend money here, um, to, to perhaps refuel or for um, for larger boats to, um, to to take on water. Um, there's thousands of boats go past these islands um, each year, and they're they're going they're going past with um, with uh, people who would I'm sure would love to come to the islands. I think well, each of the islands have their own intrinsic um, values. Um, I don't think the islands. My view is that islands don't need to be overdeveloped to um, to attract. Uh, people here, they, their um, their natural values and their cultural values um, uh, certainly attract me and many many other people. Um, the great difficulty is the access, car parking to um, to get onto the ferry, or if you're in a boat, um, where do you where do you put your boat? You know, I'm just lucky I've got a little aluminium tinny. I don't mind it being knocked around on the rocks, but that's not for everyone. I'd just like to to make a comment about. Uh, Clay Island foreshore reclamation. 
Uh, we are still waiting for permits from the state to go ahead. And if we didn't have to do that, we could have been building that thing years ago. Uh, we're still working through a couple of issues there. We're getting closer and closer, but the, the fact of the matter is, and this is just my own personal opinion, it's got nothing to do with Matt because he has nothing to do with it, but having the state to have the control over our foreshores, just our beaches, what we can do on it, is so problematic. There are so many things we could do if the council had the control over the foreshores in our city. So that's one of the biggest problems. However, when the Maclay Island foreshore is done, and we've got that artificial beach there, and then in a couple of years, we, we're looking at changing these jetties because they're due to go in uh, 2018. I think that's the opportunity to have lots of uh, uh, different configurations for boats to pull up and things like that. So there is opportunity, but of everything I've tried to do on these islands, anything on the waterfront is by hard, far the hardest, hardest thing to do. Thank you, Mark. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a couple more written questions, then I'm going to let you have a five minute stand up and stretch because I can see some of you are starting to digest your lunch and going off, and then we'll, get, we'll keep going for another half an hour once we've done that. So two questions, a break, and then half an hour. Okay, Mark and Karen, in relation to the recent city plan, the cost of treatment plans for new builds is a definite barrier to entrances for residents and businesses. Where does sewerage infrastructure sit in the scheme of things? Yeah, okay. Probably the, f the first thing to understand is that the, the, the real difficulty, as I see, when built using septic system is the size of the blocks of land. Because before you can actually build a house, you've got to allocate how much trenching you need, and then you've got to have the same amount of backup trenching, and that determines your house footprint. But where it really becomes difficult is if you want to build a business. There are only small blocks of land here for commercial use. And by the time you allocate the room for a car park and all your trenching, it's nigh on impossible for any business to, to buy a block of land to do something with. But there's a lot of improvements and uh, innovation coming in, in uh, sewage processing. Uh, there has been, for example, there's been a company that's been coming to these islands for the last couple of years and looking at models where they can, they'll actually acquire land, acreage, and put their micro sewage treatment plant in, and then they'll go into the CBD areas. They've been looking at Russell and on Maclay, and people actually pay to be part of it, just like they're on the mainland. So there's those sorts of uh, things that can be looked at. On Maclay Island, there's a cluster of about 30 houses, I believe, that are hooked up to the golf course, which have got resolve that, so they're using the golf course. So there's other opportunities for us to look in the future where we're getting a bit of development going along, using some council land as the processing area for trenching and things like that. I, I would just caution about wanting to jump into having a proper uh, sewerage network if you're on septic already. The, the cost to connect to a new sewerage system Take out all your old septic tanks, remediate the land, etc. is in the vicinity of $15,000. And that's a cost you'd have to bear yourself if you've got an existing property. So, uh, personally, I'm quite happy to maintain my own septic system on my house and these other opportunities. But the, the commercial areas are the things that need to be addressed, and there are opportunities in that space with uh, private little uh, sewage companies. Excellent. All right, last question for this session is on my phone. Frank, we talk about growth on the islands, yet the attractions of the islands is their location within a vast marine park and their beauty. If we maintain the current growth, the impact on the very things that make these islands attractive will be destroyed, such as loss of vegetation, pollution of the bay and loss of habitat. How does Council and the Government intend to address this issue? Thank you. Well, I think um, Council's been doing what it can over the last 20 or 30 years acquiring hundreds and hundreds of blocks of land uh, and can I say that we've done that uh, with no assistance from other levels of government. I'll say that with no assistance from other levels of government. We've bought back land and we've had an acquisition program and a land swap program for quite some time. In fact, uh, I've written a number of times to ask just in fact if they would waive the stamp duty cost of us buying back land. 
um, the state government and have been given a big NO every single time. Uh, so we are absolutely cognizant of the natural environment of these islands and our Moulton Bay. And we also know that population growth is a challenge um, to maintaining that. And I think councils before me and as we continue have been acknowledging that by doing just what I've said, acquiring land um, as best as we can and afford. And, uh, and obviously, you know, that, that means conservation land as well as uh, residential land. So I think it'd be nice to see other levels of government who started this journey um, kick into the can. And as you would know too, the, a couple of government, state governments ago, they had that 10 year moratorium and people were allowed to develop. Well, I think that's just ended, am I right, Mark? So, um, you know, so that was actually driving growth for a little bit. People were gonna build their house on their block of land before that moratorium um, ended. So we're doing our best um, and we, we totally understand the environmental values of this part of the world. I, I think council is best placed to, to understand the population uh, pressures. Um, so taking Karen's point, I, I'd be very happy to advocate to uh, the current state government uh, and with, um, with the shadow ministers in relation to stamp duty and, and kicking the can. That be a refund on the properties we bought for the last 20 years? Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, right. That's a bridge. That's a bridge too far. Um, personally, I think uh, Russell Island's pretty well catered for now. Those all the, the land we've acquired, and we just there's there's more blocks we are trying to get hold of. Um, Maclay Island does concern me because there's uh, so many blocks that there's as a right to build upon, and I think we need to be looking in that space of. Um, if there's, uh, the state government could help fund it or whatever, but I think there's opportunities to acquire land on Maclay Island to create that park-like presence when you drive around. Um, I think Russell's a little bit insulated for it of how the amount of land we own here, but I think there, I do have some concerns with Maclay. Great, thank you. So, a couple of minutes stretching break. If you have any more questions,